of uh, Bishul Akum. What does that mean? There is a Shulchan Aruch Yerodea, a part of the Shulchan Aruch which talks about the food which was cooked by a non-Jew. So what does that mean? That a lot of people think, you know, there's a common misconception. that Oh yeah, you know, I'll go to a non-Jewish restaurant and I'll just have some fish over there. You know, so is it allowed to have the fish over there? I'm just eating some salmon or some tuna. Yeah, what's the problem? The problem is it was cooked by a non-Jew. You know, so you're not allowed to have food which is cooked by a non-Jew. So who made this takana? Who made this uh, decree to not have food cooked by non-Jews? This was made by the sages, by the Chachamim. And the reason why they made it was because two reasons that are brought down in the Poskim, and the Rishonim. The Rambam says, and also many other Rishonim, earlier authorities, they say the reason is because of Chatanut. So what is Chatanut? What does that mean? Intermarriage. Right? What does that mean? That the rabbis were always afraid that if you come to eat the food cooked by non-Jews, you're going to wind up marrying a Goya, marrying a non-Jewish girl, right? How, why is that? What's the reason why? Because what happens is that usually the issue of uh, uh, intermarriage comes through meals. You know, like going to a meal, going to a party, going to something, event like that, where there's food, dinner, lunch, whatever it is, right? So they tell you, oh, come over, you know, yeah, yeah. I have kosher food for you, you know, come over to my house, eat in my house. Goy tells you, right? Everything is kosher. Don't worry, I don't, I don't eat pork, I don't eat anything like that, everything is good. I'm just going to give you some, uh, some tuna fish, some salmon, you know, and scrambled eggs, omelets I'll make for you. Right? So you say, oh, that sounds good. Okay, so you go over, right? And uh, you're eating, right, all the kosher food that he gave you, and all of a sudden, he's got a daughter over there, right, in his house, and you've got a son, you brought your son with you. So the son sees the daughter, you know, they check each other out. They went out on a date. All of a sudden, they're telling you next year, oh yeah, we want to get married, daddy. Right? <laughs> you know, that's the way it works, right? So the meals bring people together. You know, the social, socializing brings them together. And this is what causes intermarriage. So this is the reason why the rabbis made this decree not to eat food which was cooked by non-Jews. This is a, uh, yeah. A lot of the kosher places, uh, places. Yeah, we're going to talk about that. It's a very important uh, question, right? This whole thing. So there's also another minority opinion which is brought down in Rashi. Rashi says the reason is not because of, um, of, uh, of intermarriage. He says the reason is because we're afraid that the goy may put some non kosher ingredient into the food. You know, he may slip something in there. I see. Uh, slip it in, right? I see. I'll give you an example, by the way. That uh, we used to, you know, when we were in Israel, the rabbi used to tell us, Moreno, Rabbeinu, Moravadia, used to tell us that there was actually a case in Israel where they brought like a French chef to Israel. You know, these French chefs, they know how to cook, you know, they're really like gourmet, very professional. Voila, right? So what they do is they like to cook everything. They have a tendency, you know, propensity to cook everything with dairy, like with, with butter. Like, you know, their meat dishes, they put butter in there. You know, kalakev, you know. They put it into the chicken. You know, it gives it that soft, tender taste. It gives it that special taste, you know. So what happened was that they brought this French guy. And obviously he knew he was coming to cook kosher. I mean, was, you know. But anyway, what he was doing is, you know, when people were not looking, he was slipping in some butter into the meat dishes. You know. Because that's the way he always cooks. He was, he was trained like that. You know, that's their custom, you know what I mean? So because of that, what, they, what happened was they caught him, you know? Karakevs did that, you know? Karakevs. Why would you <laughs> This is the way they cook the French. Yeah. You know, French cooking is all about butter, whatever. Yeah. So what happens is that they're putting, putting in butter, so they caught him, and they told him, they said, how could you do that? Don't you know you're, we're doing kosher over here? Right, right. So he says, oh, but we have to do like, you know, this, and you have to get a special taste, you know, and only butter can give you the taste. It's not going to help you to put margarine in there, you know, or some, something else. Some kind of substitute. It has to be real butter. So what do they do? They throw them out, you know? Gag this. <laughs> That's what they did. What can you do? You know, you can't trust somebody. You have to throw them out. Gag them. Send them back to France. Send them back to Paris, wherever he came from, right? That's the idea. So uh, this is also another reason why a person shouldn't eat cooked by, uh, food cooked by non-Jews because they may put some non-kosher ingredients in there, right? Another example is like this. You know, like, uh, you know when we were growing up as kids, you know, we were eating like, you know, like these uh, cake, little cake foods, you know, like Twinkies and devil dogs, you know, hostess, right? So the Twinkies, you know, you're not allowed to eat those because they're made with lard. You know what I mean? So what does that mean? It's animal fat that they're using. You know, konebi, you know, uh, konebi, you know, uh, this kind of thing, right? 
Why do I use that, by the way? Because it gives us a special taste. It gives us that twinky taste, you know? That something special there, you know? So, we're not allowed to, not to have that. Wasn't there uh, yeah. some kind of a provision where a certain amount of it could be... Yeah, yeah, it's true what you're saying. It's true yeah. what you're saying. If it's less than 1 60th, you know? Right. But the problem is that it's, apparently it's not like that, so you know? Yeah, that. right, exactly. Saturated with that stuff. So, if you can taste it, it's already probably prohibited, you know? That means it's more than 1 60th, if you taste it. If you don't taste it, you're right. But the whole point over there is it gives it that special taste. You know, that large, you know, taste, whatever. So, konevi, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so, this is the reason why they made this uh, decree. Another reason right, why they made the decree not to eat these kinds of foods. Because sometimes they put lard in certain kinds of foods, right? In the old days also, it was fairly common to put lard also, like in bread, you know, to make bread. Nowadays, not so much, because it's not healthy. People know that, you know, animal fat is not healthy. A lot of cholesterol there, trans fat, all kinds of stuff. So therefore, they stopped using it, more or less, you know, by and large. But still, you know, when it comes to things like Twinkies and stuff like this, they, that taste cannot be made in any, any other way. So, you know, that, so all the other hostess foods are kosher. They have OU, you know, but Twinkies is not kosher. Mm-hmm. Last time I checked, that's the way it was. Right, Maybe something right. changed, I don't know, but that's the, that's the way it always was. So this is the whole, uh, the whole idea, right? So they do sometimes put things like this, and sometimes you don't feel it, you know, like you can't even taste sure. it. You can't, so, you know, like you could, they could slip it right into you. So these are the two reasons why uh, the rabbi said not to use, uh, not to eat food which is cooked by non-Jews. So therefore, a person has to be careful about that. So that means that going to a non-kosher restaurant, you know, when they're, you know, a non-Jewish restaurant, there's really no option like that. You know, I mean, what could you really have over there? You could have maybe a Heineken, you know, Coca-Cola, you know, drink something, you know, or maybe have some cucumbers and tomatoes, you know, some raw, raw vegetables, whatever, you know. Even that, you have to be careful sometimes because they have bugs, certain things, romaine lettuce, you know, things like this, they have bugs. So anyway, right, so what are you, you going to really do much there? You can't watch, you can do that. So therefore, a person is not allowed to eat in, in, a, in, a, in a non-Jewish restaurant. This is the reason why he's not allowed to eat there. Okay, so, you know, there's a lot of details about this. I want to discuss a lot of, a lot of issues that come up from this, uh, arise from this, uh, this issue. Number one, the sages said like this, right, that in order to be prohibited, there has to be two conditions to prohibit the food. Otherwise, it's allowed. Number one is that it goes up on the table of kings, right? What does that mean? That Trump would eat it, you know, in the White House, you know, or in the, in the uh, right, in the Alize, you know, in the, that guy over there, what's his name? In the France, right? The, the president, Macron, Macron, Macaroni. Right? The Macaroni would also eat it over there. People like this, you know, kings, presidents, prime ministers, they would also eat it, this kind of food. What does that mean? That it's considered to be something uh, prominent, you know, some food which is, you know, important, has some, uh, right, has some significance to it. Not something like flimsy too much, you know, too flimsy. It doesn't go up to their table. They don't want to eat it, stuff like that. This is the reason why the Rambam says something interesting. You know what it says? That even though, like nuts, let's say, right, for instance, like, you know, you buy planters, you know, like these roasted uh, peanuts, and there's a lot of companies that make things like this, right, from the, from the end of the world, uh, to the end of the world. So if they're roasted, are you allowed to have those? Because we just said, right, you're not allowed to have anything which is cooked by a goy. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So it says the Rambam, it's allowed to have those. Mm-hmm. And what's the reason why? So it says the Rambam, because these things are not something which go on the table of kings, now, what does that mean, right? Does that mean that Trump won't eat any, uh, any roasted nuts? Right? So they may. I mean, why not? You know, for dessert, they may bring some nuts over there, or maybe it's a side dish. Some, you know, made, some side dishes made with nuts. They do make things like that. So then what are we talking about? That it's, it's like the, the, the Rambam. What is the Rambam talking about? What the Rambam means like this, right? The way he explains it is that, you know, it's true that it goes up on our table, mm-hmm. but it goes up as something like, you know, something like on the side, you know, not the, the important dish that you're eating. So what does that mean? It's not something you would, invite, you would invite somebody over to eat, you know, just that. Like, let's say, you know, I call you up, right? Oh, how are you, David? You know, how are you? The, uh, you know, you want to come over and eat by my house today? Yeah, sure. What do you have? So I tell you, oh, you know, I have, uh, I have uh, peanuts. <laughs> so you're thinking, like, you're inviting me for peanuts? <laughs> That's like peanuts. <laughs> what are you inviting me for that for? Nobody invites you to just eat peanuts. You know what I mean? Or nobody's going to invite you just to have, let's say, uh, French fries, you know? Or just to have white rice, you know? Like, oh yeah, you want to come over to eat? Okay, what are you having? We're having white rice. With what? Nothing. Just white rice. 
you can, you're inviting me for white rice. Nobody does that. You know what I mean? So this, this is the reason why things like this, which are not so important, that the person who wants to invite you for that, they're exempt from this prohibition. So that's what the Rambam says. So therefore, according to this, right, all those planters' nuts that are roasted will have to have them, even though it was roasted by a goy. Because, because nobody invites you for that. It's not something important. Uh, there's also uh, the other element, which is that what? It has to be something which cannot, cannot be eaten raw. But if it can be eaten raw, even though it was cooked, there's no prohibition. What's a good example? Let's say, for instance, carrots, right? Carrots, you can have all the all raw. You don't have to cook it to eat carrots. Or broccoli, let's say, right? Broccoli, does you have to cook it? No. What about onions? You don't have to cook onions. You know? So these things you can eat raw. They're edible as when they're raw. So therefore... Even, even if the goy cook them, they're allowed because you can have them without cooking. <clears throat> this is the idea. So things, all kinds of things like this. Let's say, you know, like some people like to cook uh, apples, you know, and make some kind of dessert. So, but apples can be eaten all raw as well. So there's no problem with that, you know. The goy cooked an apple. No problem. Apple pie. You know, like that would be an example. No problem with that. Because, yeah. Uh, yeah. So uh, even though we have to discuss the other element of the apple pie, which is the, uh, the crust. We're going to talk about that a little bit later. But uh, anyway, the point is, right, anything that can be eaten raw, this, by the way, also applies, you know, to what? It applies to, like, let's say you go to Delhi, right? You go into a place like this, owned by a goy. You tell him, you know what, make me some coffee, you know, or make me some tea. Are you allowed to ask him? But, ah, water is cooked there, right? They cook the water. So the answer is Yes. You know why? Because you can also have the water raw. It doesn't need to be cooked to drink water. You know what I mean? So all these things you can have raw, no problem to, to ask the goy to cook them for you. This is the idea. So, uh, so then what would be prohibited? Like things like, let's say, potatoes, right? Can you eat a potato raw? Not really. It's too hard, right? It's like a rock. You can't eat that thing. Or let's say rice, right? Doesn't anybody eat rice raw? Nobody eats that. Right? It's too hard. It's like rocks. So these things like this, which cannot be eaten uh, raw, they, so then they will be prohibited if they were made by a goy. This is the idea, you know? So this is the criterion. So we have these two conditions. According to these two conditions, we have to be able to judge whether you're allowed to eat that food or not if it was cooked by a goy. Something also interesting comes up. I want to discuss some like, individual ele- elements of this halakha. Because uh, I think we already spoke about it one time, maybe a year or two ago. But there are some things which I didn't bring up, which is like this, right? That the, there's also regarding fish. So fish, also, if fish was cooked by a goy, you're not allowed to have that fish. Just like, you know, any because fish is important food. You know, I mean, definitely you would invite somebody to have a nice fish. You would you would invite somebody for that. Sure. You know, some trout, some uh, right, some salmon. Mm-hmm. It's good stuff, right? Definitely heavy duty stuff. So then, what about if a goy cooked it? What's the halacham? So it says in the Shulchan Aruch something interesting. Siman Kufi Gimel over there. It says over there, there's two types of fish when it comes to this halacha. One is that there's fish which are large fish, large, and there are small fish. So that's not the same thing. You know why? You know why? Because large fish is like, let's say, tuna and salmon. You know, those are big fish. You know what I mean? Then you have the small ones like, you know, sardines and, uh, you know, like uh, herring. Yeah. Those are small fish, right? things like this. Mm-hmm. So the difference is like this. If you salt, just salt it, right, small fish, it's already edible as it is because the salt like, makes it like cooked, makes it edible. You know? That's why herring is not cooked, by the way. All they do is they, they, they pickle it. They pickle it, they salt it, and it's edible. You know? So it's not, herring is not cooked. Also, sardines, right? Sardines are really not cooked. They're just like, they steam them a little bit. They steam them, you know, a little steaming. Yeah. You don't have to cook it in the pot or something like that. They're smoked. They're yeah, they're exactly. Smoked, steamed, whatever it is. They steam them. So the point is, right, that they, these small fish do not require cooking. So therefore, the rule is that since it doesn't require cooking, so if it was already salted and it's edible, and the goy now cooked it, it's allowed to have that fish. Why is that? Because it was already edible before that. Why, why, why was it edible? Because it was salted. But when it comes to big fish, it's not like that. What does that mean? If you just salt like salmon, right, or tuna, 
or you know other big fish like Nile perch, you know things like this. Those do not become edible because they're large. You know they need they need to be cooked, at least to be smoked or something, right? Or cooked cooked uh, somehow in an oven in a pan, whatever it is. So since they're not edible by salting, so therefore if the goy cooked it, it's not allowed to have that. That's the idea, you know. So there's a difference between large fish and small fish. This is the idea. So therefore, if a person goes to the store and uh, you know buys um, he buys uh, like you know these small fish, you know like sardines, there's no prohibition to eat those because uh, because they're you know they're edible without without uh, without cooking and they're not really cooked anyway, as we said, right? There's no problem with that. So it depends on the situation, right? How how it was done. So. Uh, this is the way this is the way it works with these with these kinds of things. There's also another interesting halakha, which is like this: that there are some times where the goy he actually cooked something, you know, he cooked, but he did he was, his intention was not to cook. I'll give you an example of what that means. Let's say, for instance, right, he heated up an oven, right, the goy. He turned on the oven, and the food was already in there, but he heated it up for a different purpose. He just let's say wanted to, uh, you know make the oven more stronger. You know, sometimes you make it stronger by heating it. There's all kinds of things like this that they do. Or they, let's say, in the making it stronger was in the old days. Today they don't do that. But the truth is, like, you know, I'll give you an example. Let's say you have, have a self-cleaning oven, right? So how does a self-cleaning oven work? You put it on high heat, you know, and it cleans it. Right? So let's say the guy put on a put on a self-cleaning mode and there was food in there. He didn't know. You know, and it got cooked. Are you allowed to have that? The answer is Yes. You know why? Because he didn't intend to cook. His intention was just to clean the oven. You know? You understand? So since his intention was only to clean the oven and not to cook, there you're allowed to have the food. Right. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. That's the idea. So this is the, this is the whole thing. As we said, right, the, the whole purpose over here is to prevent intermarriage. Another thing which uh, comes up very often in our society is like this, right? You go to the restaurant... And you have over there um, food which is cooked by goyim, because in those restaurants most of the cooks are not Jewish. You know, uh, so then how do how do they put the hechsher on the restaurant like that if it's cooked by a goy? So in order to understand that, we have to understand one thing first, right? Number one is that there are there are two different opinions regarding this. The prevailing opinion is that uh, a goy has to how do you how do you make the food edible. Let's say you have a goy helping you in the kitchen, right? You have a maid, let's say you have a maid or a butler, you know, whatever, a cook. Or let's say you're working in a restaurant, right? And you have over there a goy who's helping with the food, with the preparation, with the cooking. So, are you allowed to employ the goy there? Apparently, they do. So, then how do they do it? So, there's several ways to do this. Number one is like this, right? Let's say you put the food on the on the fire as a Jew, right? You're a Jew. You put the food on, and then Goy then continues to cook it, you know, like stirs it, flips it, all kinds of stuff like this, right? That's allowed. Why is that? Because you started the cooking, and he finished it. So he's participating in the cooking, but you also did something there, you know? You put, the, you put it on the fire. That's allowed. He helped you to cook it, but he didn't do it all by himself. This is allowed, you know? So if you're doing it this way, there's no problem. Also, there's the other way around, right? The opposite way. What does that mean? Let's say the goy placed the food on the, pl- on the fire. He's the one who placed it on the fire. So now, what do you do? Ah, it's going to be cooked by a goy. He's the one who placed it. So how do you, how do you help that? So what you should do is like, right, go and stir the food a little bit. Because that helps it to cook more, right? Faster. You stir it. It gets hotter like that. So if the goy put the food on the fire, you could go and stir it. And then it's going to be allowed. Why is that? Because you helped him to cook. Even though he also did something by putting on the flame, on the fire, but you're also helping him by stirring. Or let's say if it was a steak, right? You, you flipped it, you know? That's also you're helping him, right? To cook it, by, by flipping it. So if he put it, you can flip it. That would be also good. So you can have like a double thing going on there, you know? Together. He's cooking together with you. That's allowed. The only problem is like this, right? That, that sometimes this could be forbidden. You know what it is? If the goy put the food on the fire and it got one-third cooked already. You know, one-third it got cooked. It's like rare, you know? Like, but barely edible. And like barely, you know? A person who's not so fastidious would eat that. You know? Uh, 
you know what they call that in the, in the Talmud? They call that Mahab ben Drusai. You know what that means? It's a food of somebody who was called ben Drusai. Who was this ben Drusai? This guy was a bandit, you know, gangster. Who was alive at the time of the Talmud. They say that he used to like eating food like very rare. What does that mean? Like one third cooked, you know, he would eat it. That was like his delicacy. You know? So that's the way he did it. So since he would eat it like that, there are some people who would eat it when it's very rare. Like all red inside, you know? Tell you, you know? Some people like to eat like that. So since some people actually do do that, it's considered to be like cooked for all intents and purposes. So therefore, if he cooks it one third, the rule is, right, that uh, you cannot really save that anymore because it's already like edible. So it's too late. But says the Shulchan Ruch, there's three exceptions to that that we allow you to get off that. A leniency we give you regarding that. One is that, let's say it's Erev Shabbat, right? you're cooking on Friday for Shabbat. So since you're doing a mitzvah, making food for Shabbat, so there, even if it was one-third cooked, you can still have it. It was one-third cooked by the goy. He put it on the flame, you didn't touch it for one-third, you can still have it. Or it's Erev Yom Tov, it's the, it's the eve of the uh, holidays, festivals, right? Pesach, Shavuot, Sukkot. Also there, because of the holiday, we allow you to have it. Even though you already cooked it one-third. And you're going to cook it the rest of the way. Also, there's another reason why they allow it. says the Shulchan Ruch, we also allow it because of Hefset Merubeh. You know what that means? That you, it's going to cause you a loss. Let's say, right? If you have to throw this food in the garbage, because the goy cooked it, that's a lot of money, you know? You're losing a lot of money here. You know, like I was, I was talking inside the shul, and, I, you know, like there's, there's like a scenario today where they, all these restaurants, you know, they have shawarma, right? Israel, America. So the way it works is like this, right? The, 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 one of the guys, you know, comes, brings this big beef, you know, side of beef on a skewer. You know, a shawarma, and he puts it over there, you know, it's very heavy, like this. So bring it over there, you know, places it. Ah! And all day that meat is like being cut and served to everybody. You know, by the end of the day, it should be like already like empty. You know, that's the way it works, right? If they have a good customer, if they have a good, good customer base over there. So that shawarma rack that they bring to put it, right, if the goy put it, so that means that the goy cooked it. You know what I mean? So what should you do in a case like that, right? So obviously the best thing to do is that the, goy, the, the, uh, the Jew should put it. You know what I mean? That shawarma, not the goy. Because once the goy puts it, then you have to do something to make it cook faster. And it's already spinning by itself, you know, with the machine. So there's not really much you can do. You know, maybe like to fit, make it go faster. I don't know exactly if it's possible to do that. But the point is, right, that let's say a goy put that, that shawarma, that whole rack of shawarma, right? That's, you know how much it's worth, that, that whole rack? How much? Like $500, maybe. Mm. It's a lot of money, you know? It's a big piece of meat, right? Huge. It goes all day. So now, if I have to throw this out in the garbage because the goy cooked it, right? It's going to be a big loss. $500, you know, it's a lot of money. You know what I mean? Can you imagine? Vashkiah comes and tells you, no, no, you have to throw it out, sir. You know, this is a, it was cooked by a goy, you know? Like, you're like, ah, $500 you want me to lose? So says the Shulchan Ruch, if it's going to be a big loss like that, you can, you can, you can eat it because uh, the loss is very, very great, $500, you know? The truth is that when it comes to Hefset Merubeh, something which is going to be lost, you know, it's going to cause you a loss, it, all, it really doesn't depend on, you know, if it's a lot of money. It could be like for you it's a lot of money. In other words, it goes according to the individual. If you're, if you're according to your budget, let's say, right, if $20 is a lot of money, you know, you can also rely on that as well. You know what I mean? Depending on your budget, you know, a person has a certain, you know, for pe- some people $20 is like nothing, you know, it's like, uh, it's, it's like a nickel for them. You know, for some people $20 is like one day's, you know, money. They spend that one day doing all kinds of things. So, depending on the situation, right? For you, that may be a lot of money. So, if it's a lot of money for you, it's called self said bit. So, therefore, in a case like that, even though the goy cooked it one third, you're still allowed to have that food. So, what does that mean? We do have certain leniencies when it comes to this case because it's not so clear cut. Why? Because he only cooked it one third after all, you know? Not all the way. He didn't cook it all the way. He cooked it only one third. And you're going to come and do the rest? So, you know, depending on certain cases, there may be a way to get out of that. But in general, if he cooked it one third, it's already not kosher. Right? So you have to make sure that that what? That if he placed it on the fire, you should do something to stir it a little bit or something, you know, to, 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 make, to help the, with the cooking. This is the idea. But the truth is, right, that even though we talk about all this issue now, all, this, all these details, but there's also another detail which has to be known, which is that what? 
that when you go to a restaurant, some, sometimes over there, the guy is doing all the cooking. And we're not talking about one-third or one-fourth. We're talking about everything. The, goy, the Jew is not even touching the food. Until he eats it, he puts it in his mouth. That's, about, you know, that's the only time he touches it. So then how does it work like that? Right? So the truth is that there are two opinions regarding that. There's the Ashkenazi uh, approach, and there's the Sephardi approach. So according to the Shulchan Aruch, which is Sephardi, the way it works is as, like we t- just told you now. But according to the Ashkenazi, they have a leniency regarding this. You know what the leniency is? That if the Jew comes in the morning, let's say they're working in a restaurant or whatever, some factory, all he has to do is just light the fire in the morning, you know, in the oven, or the gas, whatever it is, right, the stove, and the goy can cook all day because he lit the fire. You know what I mean? This is enough. But according to Sephardi custom, according to Shulchan this is not enough. The Jew has to actually place the food on the fire or do some stirring or flip it around. It's not enough just to, just to light the fire. So therefore, the rule is different from the Sephardi Mashkenazim. You know? We're more stringent, the Sephardi, we're more stringent, and therefore we don't rely on that. But the truth is that Mran Ravadia, he told us that in cases of great need, a person can rely on that too, even if it's Sephardi. So what does that mean? There's a double doubt regarding this. That you can rely on that. What's a double doubt? One doubt is that maybe the halachas like the Rama, like the Ashkenazim, that the, lighting the fire is enough. Because there are some authorities that say like that. That's one doubt. The other doubt is that perhaps when you're, when you're in a public setting, the rules of, of a goy cooking is, doesn't apply over there. And this is the opinion of the Ravad. The Ravad says so. So what does that mean? That in a public setting, since we're not really so particular according to the, the Ravad, that... Um, that, are, that should be cooked by a goy. By the way, why is that? Now, I ask you a question, right? Why is it that according to this opinion, if it's in a public setting, we don't care so much if the goy cooks it? As opposed to a private setting. What does that mean, private setting? Like in your house. You have a maid, you have a cook in your house. It's, public setting and private setting is not the same thing. So, you know what the reason is? Because we already mentioned in the beginning of the, of the lecture that the reason of this prohibition is what? that you don't want to eat something cooked by a goy because of hatanut, because of intermarriage. You know what I mean? So since the whole prohibition is intermarriage, so according to this opinion that we just mentioned, what they're saying is like this, right? In a public place, it doesn't apply. Why is that? Because there's no intimacy in a public place, you know? Like the, so there's no danger of intermarriage there. You know what I mean? We're talking about like a restaurant. The cook is by himself over there behind the counter somewhere, cooking or inside, inside the back room somewhere. So there's no intimacy with, the, with that person. So when does the intimacy only come? When you're in like a private setting, in a home, you know? At home, your home, or his home, whatever it is, right? So there, there's a chance where if you cook together, if you let the goy cook, there's going to be intimacy, and it's going to lead to intermarriage. But when it comes to public places, there's no intimacy there. Like you're not talking to him, he's not talking to you. He's working, you're dining, right? You're, you know, you're there, you're there for different purposes. You know what I mean? So since you're there for different purposes, there's really no interaction so much there. So we're not afraid of that, right? What are you going to do? Find his daughter over there, right? He's working over there. He's not going to bring his daughter there. So you know what I mean? Is that the answer for how he's gone? <laughs> so that's the reason why if a goy is cooking, you know what I mean? According to Ashkenazim, uh, as we said, right? But even a Sephardi can rely on us if he has no choice. What does that mean, no choice? That means that he has no restaurant in his area yeah. where the Jew is cooking, you know? So he can go to a restaurant where the goy is cooking there as long as the Jew lit the fire in the morning. So what are we relying on? We're relying on this double doubt that we just, we just, just described to you. Right? But this is, you know, as we said, this is not really our custom, but we rely on it because of no choice. You know? So sometimes you know, we allow leniency like this. Uh, because also there's also the element that you know, this whole prohibition is only from the rabbis. You know? mm-hmm. So therefore, right, we're not going to go that far even when there's a double doubt to, to be stringent like that. Oh, That's the idea. You know? So this is the, this is the way to, to get around this issue of, uh, of a goy cooking, you know, to have this kind of thing. But the truth is, if you have a restaurant where the Jew is cooking over there, like I'll give you an example. I don't know how it is with Hapisga, you know, because I don't, I haven't been there like 20 years, I don't know. I don't remember, last time you took me there, probably was last time I was there. Yeah. You know, and... Uh, there's no Jewish cooks there. There's no Jewish cooks no. there. Interesting what you're saying. Yeah. Right. Yeah, but when it comes to like, let's say, a person uh, like that place, you know, uh, on Main Street, that has Jewish cooks over there. You know the place I'm talking about? On the corner of Main Street and Jewel? Yeah, yeah. What's that place called? I don't know if it's still there. Right, it's still there, still there. Yeah, yeah. That place like has Jewish cooks, you know? At least some of them, whatever. 
So if you have, if you can go to a place with a Jewish cook, better. You know, as long as the quality is decent, right? You don't want to go to eat some, you know, spend money on, on nothing. I mean, you know, on very poor, poor quality food. So, I mean, you know, if the quality is decent, it's a good, good place. So then you should opt to go to a place where Jews are cooking over there. Much, much better, obviously. You know, that's the idea. There's also a very simple solution, you know. If a person, let's say, uh, you know, wants to be uh, stringent about this, you know, you can just tell like the uh, mashkiach, you know, in the restaurant, some Jewish guy who's, who's there, can you please, please like put, put the steak for me on the grill? You put the steak on the grill for me, you know, do me a favor. Don't let the guy do it. You know, he'll probably do it for you. You, wanna, you won't mind, you know, if he's a nice guy, if he's a decent guy. Mm. So, you know, if you really want to be uh, stringent about it and do it the right, proper way, this is the way to do it, you know, this is the, this is the idea. So there, is a, there, are, there are ways to, 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 right, to, to get, get by with these uh, kinds of issues. But you know what they asked me, by the way, when I talked about these halachot inside synagogue, right away I was, uh, you know, they, they tapped me on the other side. They said, yeah, but what about, uh, you know, those cakes that they make? You know, that they sell, which are kosher, like entenmans. You know, you know what I'm talking about, right? Sure, sure. Entenmans cakes. And there's also other types of kosher cakes, yeah, you know? A few. Right, a few, a few companies, right? But they don't, they're not, they're, uh, they're made by goyim. They're baked by goy. Mm-hmm. So then how do we eat them? This was the question, right, that they asked me. Very good question. Now Hanukkah's coming, right, Hanukkah. We're going to be eating sufganiyot, you know, donuts all the time, right? Day and night donuts. That's all we eat on Hanukkah. So what about those, right? They're made by goy. How do you eat them? So you know what the answer is? That when it comes to like things which are like mezonot, cakes and cookies, things like this, mezonot, so it's considered to be like bread in this halakha. So the, the rules of bread and the rules of cooking dishes is not the same thing. Well, what does that mean? The rule is like this, right? That the rabbis made a takana, the rabbis made a decree not to eat non-Jewish bread. Right? For the same reason, by the way, because they may come together, the intermarriage. So they made a the, the, the decree not to eat non-Jewish bread. So what does that mean, right? Italian bread, you know, things like this, right? Stuff, stuff that you find in the supermarket. You're not supposed to eat that. But what happened was that the Jews couldn't keep this decree. You know, they were not able to keep it. Why is that? Because there were places, there were people living in places where there's no Jewish bakery there. You know, so what are you going to do? Starve to death? Because there's no Jewish bakery. You know, what am I going to do? You know, so therefore the rabbis canceled this this decree. So the rule is like this, right? That when the rabbis see that the people cannot keep the decree, they cancel it. That's what they did. You know, so therefore now it's more or less it's allowed to have. Bread that was made by a non-Jew today, nowadays, because the decree was cancelled. But it wasn't cancelled all the way. What does that mean? It says in the Shulchan Ruch that if you have like a Jewish bakery, you don't have a non-Jewish bakery, so you should opt to buy in a Jewish bakery. Because you have a choice, you know? But if you don't have a choice, or let's say the Jewish bakery is like very poor quality, you know? And the other one is really good. So, you know, why would you want to eat poor quality bread all your life? You know, it's not, it's not fair to you, it's not fair to anybody, right? So, therefore, because of that reason... You're allowed to eat also non-Jewish bread because it's not the quality is not good, or let's say it's very expensive, it's overpriced. They charge you like double, you know, for Jewish bread. Why would you? Why would you want to pay double? What? What's, what is it? What? You know what I mean? For all these reasons, right? You're allowed to have uh, you're allowed to have non-Jewish bread as long as what? As long as they don't use lard, right? As we said, right? As be vegetable shortening, you know. Make sure they put vegetable shortening over there, not lard, uh, and then it's, there's no problem because everything is kosher there. You know, what is in there, right? Yeast, you know, salt, flour, you know, things like this, right? Basic ingredients. Things like this, you know, are, are okay. As long as you know what the ingredients are over there. Or it has a heksher, has OU, okay, whatever it is, right? Has a heksher. It's not every bread has a heksher. But you don't really need a heksher to eat bread. All you have to do is you have to know that there's no, they don't use lard, you know, or, or animal fats or things like this, you know, which are not allowed to have. You know what I mean? The, obviously, it's not kosher. So the truth is, right, there are places where they don't use lard for bread. Just, it's not done, you know, it's not common. So if, if you live in a place where it's not common, you don't eat a heksher even, even without a heksher, you can eat that, you can eat that bread. But if you live in a place where it's common to put lard, like, you know when that, where that is? Like in Spanish countries, you know, Mexican country, Mexico, you know, like it's, it's Hispanic places, they love to put lard in everything. Mm. They like, they like, they like, like that Picky tastes, you know, that uh, porky taste uh, they like. So they like to put everything, in, like, they bake, like they bake with lard. And that's what it is, right? So you got to be careful. But the truth is, in general, in America, 
they're not using lard for baking bread today, nowadays. You know, so that, that's why, as long as, you know, it's baked with vegetable shortening, as we said, right? Or you know that's not the way to bake over there with lard. They don't use lard, so therefore it's allowed to have bread over there. It's not something like that. But as we said, right, that uh, better to have Jewish bread if it's possible. If it's not possible, you've got to have Goish bread. But the rule is that as, even though we do allow to have non-Jewish bread, because the decree was nullified, as we said, right? We do. We do allow. But, uh, nevertheless, uh, as we said, that it's better to have Jewish bread. We, we, already, we, already, we, we already said that. But the, the non-Jewish bread is not, is not the same thing. It depends on where it was made. Is it made in a bakery? Or is it made at home? You know, is it home homemade bread or bakery bread? So the truth is, right, bakery bread is much better than homemade What's the reason why? Because, as we said, right, that the bakery is a public place. There's no intimacy there. So therefore, there's no concern about intermarriage. You know, in a place like that. You're just going to buy bread. What does that have to do with intermarriage? Right? But if he invites you to his house, the goy, to eat his bread, that's already like intimacy, you know? So that's already much worse. So therefore, the, the poskim say, says in the Shulchan Ruch also, that the, 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 the permission to eat non-Jewish bread applies generally to only bread baked in a bakery. Not at home, not homemade bread. This is the reason why. But says says the Rashba, it's brought down in Shukhan Ruch also, that if a person has no bread besides that bread, let's say, let's say he, he needs bread for Shabbat, you know, to do the seudot, to do the meals for Shabbat, he can have, he's allowed to even have homemade bread if there's no other bread besides that. Because there's no choice, you know. But in general, homemade bread by, made by a go is not allowed to have. Also, by the way, it's more common that homemade bread is going to have like all kinds of things like this, like lard, you know, and things like this. Also, they may put butter in there, you know, like some dairy and things like this, you know. There's all kinds of uh, concerns regarding that as well. Because when they make homemade, it's not so standard, you know, they make like special, all kinds of special stuff they put in there. They want to get that taste, you know, that particular taste. Add some butter to it, add some lard to it, whatever, all kinds of things. And it gives it that special taste that they want, you know, whatever. So, uh, therefore, right, this is the reason why uh, this is the reason why the homemade bread is also more dangerous than the than the uh, uh, than the, than, the, than, the, than the bakery bread, you know. Mm-hmm. So, therefore, the rule is that uh, you want to have always, right? If you're eating a bread made by a non-Jew, it should be bakery bread and not homemade bread. As a general rule, right? That's the idea. But you know what they asked me? Now that I told you regarding bread a little bit, their question was like this. Their question was, yeah, but. Uh, you know, why is it that bread, when it comes to bread, you don't need to have uh, the, the Jew placing the, uh, the bread into the oven to cook it, right, to bake it. When it comes to cooked dishes, we said, right, the Jew has to place it in the oven mm-hmm. or place it on the fire. But when it comes to bread, the Goy is doing it and we still allow it. So you know what the answer is? The answer is Chaya Nefesh. The, the rabbis were more lenient when it comes to bread than cooked dishes. You know why? Because bread is like a staple. You can't live without bread, you know? That's what fills you up. That's what gives you satiation. So therefore, when it comes to bread, the rabbis were more lenient. And you know what they said? They said, well, we, we even allow you to have bread which was baked by a goy, but even, the Jew had nothing to do with it, right? He didn't put it in the fire. He put it in, they didn't put it in the oven. He didn't do nothing with that. Mm-hmm. Still allowed to have it. Mm-hmm. So when it comes to bread, we're more lenient. And this is the reason why we're allowed to have those Entenmann's cakes and things like this, and the donuts and all these things. Because those donuts, they're, they're all like bread, types of bread. Even if you know? Ah, so if it doesn't say kosher, then you have to make sure the ingredients at least are kosher. You know, you have to know a little bit. If you don't know, send it to your local rabbi; he'll tell you, right? If he knows how to do that, not everybody knows that. A rabbi knows how to do that, but if they know how to do it, they'll tell you, right? Whatever it is. But the point is that donuts, right, are and these cakes products. You know, if there if there there's no non-kosher ingredients in there, you know, uh, they're allowed. Why is that? Even if they're made by a goy, why is that? Because uh, because it's considered like bitter bread, just like bread is allowed, which is made by goy. But as we said, right, all this that we mentioned, nevertheless, a person should always try to buy Jewish if he can. You know what I mean? If you have a choice to buy Jewish donuts, you know, and goyish donuts, better to buy Jewish, you know, because of this reason. Uh, because the rabbis still want you to prefer the Jewish bakery over the non-Jewish bakery, if possible, when possible. You know, if it's feasible. Yeah. One rabbi asked me, you know, about this regarding this. You know what he asked me? He said, does that mean, like, you know, let's say there's no Jewish bakery in, in my area. Do I have to, like, drive to Brooklyn, you know, to, to buy Jewish bread or Jewish cakes? 
So I tell them, I said, no. I mean, you know, the, rabbi, the rabbis don't, uh, don't ask you to drive for an hour, you know, to, to go get some bread. This is not normal, you know what I mean? This is not a normal thing, you know? So you don't have to go that far. What we need to say is you have something in your neighborhood, you know, like close by, you know? Queens Boulevard, 108, you know, something like that, right? Okay, at least like, you know, Union Turnpike, you know? Uh, okay, fine, but you don't have to go to Brooklyn, you know I mean? To drive half hour very, very forth and back and forth. Uh, yeah, okay, whatever, because probably the big bakeries are taking over, you know? The, the small bakeries are dying down more, yeah. whatever, you know? There is one on 108 over here, there is one. There used to be a lot more. They closed yeah. down, a lot of them closed down. It's true. So there is also on Main Street they have right, a couple of bakeries over there. So the point is like this, right? That uh, we always prefer to have Jewish bakery if it's possible. But if it wasn't possible to have Jewish, it is possible to eat from a non-Jewish bakery as long as the ingredients are kosher. Right? When it comes to bread, you have to make sure there's no lard in there. right? It's vegetable shortening. You know, that's basically what, what we need to know. And also, you know, some, there are some breads, by the way, also, that have like milk in there. They put milk. They knead the dough with milk. You know, so you can't have it with meat, obviously. Sure. You know, so like I think I think Wonder Bread mm-hmm. has like some dairy ingredients in there, if I'm not mistaken. I haven't eaten it in like yeah. thirty years. I don't yeah. know. Whatever. Yeah. I haven't yeah, touched that stuff in thirty five years. Stuff, yeah. <laughs> it's the kitty stuff, the kitty bread, you know? Yeah. Well that uh, it's really pretty junky that stuff, you know, not so healthy. Martin not so healthy. Bread. <laughs> yeah. I agree with him. Okay, I tell you, I think he's on the he's on the he's on the ball. All right? So anyway, that's the idea, right? So uh, a person has to know all these things. So what am, what's the bottom line? That bread and cooked dishes are not the same thing, right? When it comes to cooked dishes, there has to be some Jewish cooking over there. When it comes to the bread, all you need is like one or two things, right? What does that mean? If 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 the factory, if the factory or the bakery is owned by a goy, even though he did everything himself, the Jew didn't touch that bread. You can still eat it if it's kosher, you know. If, if, if you don't have a Jewish bakery around you. When it comes to cook, cook dishes, it's not like that. What does that mean? That cook dishes, you cannot have something which was made by a goy, period. Right? That's what we said, right? Unless those conditions apply that we mentioned, right? There are certain conditions regarding that. There are certain leniencies, as we mentioned. But in general, something which was cooked by a non goy so therefore there is really no option for a person right, to go to a non-Jewish restaurant you know, and to eat there some cooked dish. You know what I mean? Because it was made by a goy, you know? So you don't have this option. When it comes to when it comes to donuts, as long as the donut is kosher, you know, I mean, uh, it's really fine, you know, as long as you don't have the Jewish donut across the street, you're okay, you know what I mean? That's the idea. So, uh, okay, I guess we'll stop here. I gotta have some more things to do tonight. Baruch Adonai Le'olam, Amen, Amen. Thanks for coming. Be blessed. Be happy. Thank you. Health, wealth, and happiness. And we should have the president, Bezal Hashem, to. Be victorious and uh, expose, not, ex- expose, the, expose those fraudulent yeah. uh, posters and those fraudulent electioneers. Yeah. Amen, amen. Hashem should help us. Call to Vladetov.